We have all been uniquely and lovingly created in the image of God and called to live in fusion with Him and with one another. I'm Robert Richard Ellis, and welcome to The Converging Zone. Welcome to The Converging Zone. Thank you for being with us. We've got a great guest today. His name is Ted Haggart. But before I introduce Ted, let's take a little clip and see uh, what Ted's been up to these days. Let's welcome back our good friend, Pastor Ted Haggart. Pastor Ted, you're a very intelligent man. They fear you. Yes. They don't want you in the government. I'll be talking to the White House in another three and a half hours. They reach out to you. Yes. An admission of guilt, a plea for forgiveness. Former evangelical leader Ted Haggard has confessed that he's had a lifelong sexual problem. Pastor Ted, last time I saw you, you were the king of a huge megachurch. Where did all your friends go? They're, they left. See, the reason I kept my personal struggle a secret is because I feared that my friends would reject me and abandon me and kick me out and that the church would exile me and excommunicate me. And that happened and more. It seems folks here wish Taddy Hager well and more importantly, they just wish him gone. The Bible says that Jesus came for the unrighteous. The Bible says that when one sheep wanders off, that Jesus will leave the 99 sheep that are together and go pursue the one. I was that one. Welcome to the show today, Ted Haggard. Hi, thank you. It's good to be here. Good to have you. We've been Thanks. on this convergent path. We've yeah. been we've we've known each other really really since the the fall. Yeah. And uh, where you got knocked off from the top. Yeah. You know. Two thousand six. Two thousand six. Yeah. And we finally get a chance to meet one another. We're right here on my show today. So it's my it, honor. It's a we're a pleasure to have you here. Yeah. Thank you. You know, Ted, this whole thing happened, um, and obviously you can't go back. Right. What, what, since that time, tell us a little bit, bit about what's been going on with your family. You've got a new church started. Talk about mm -hmm. what's been happening. Well, the family was awesome during the scandal in 2006, and they actually drew together instead of drew apart and fragmented, which is exactly how the body of Christ is supposed to be. Yep. And so we started to see that our family was strengthened and empowered because of the process we went through. Now, when the scandal happened, I, I resigned, I repented, I confessed, and I submitted. And so I walked through that process, and in that process we moved, and then uh, moved back to Colorado Springs once the overseers released uh, us from that process. And the kids just did awesome. And so it gave me a revelation about how the body of Christ can respond to someone else's sin. So it's positive and healing and constructive and empowering instead of responding to someone else's sin in a negative way that's, uh, that acts like Jesus isn't the, the solution to the sin problem. Yeah. You know, and so lots of people get dismayed or discouraged when they find out somebody else's sin, but the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And nobody's perfect until we see Jesus face to face. Now, I'm not excusing sin. Right. We need to get rid of sin. But the, the blood of Jesus and the body of Christ and the Word of God are the sanctifying influences in our life to clean, cleanse us. And so I actually felt like the process I went through in 2006 was an answer to my prayers. And I'd been praying, Lord, do whatever it takes. Yeah. And so... Yeah, because this has been a struggle and you finally, it, you finally were free. Right. And here's the thing that really bothered me when we first met and I, why I reached out to you at mm -hmm. that time was, was first of all, here's a guy broken, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, you're on the top, you're ahead of the evangelical national 
What National is, Association of Evangelicals. Yeah, and you, and you help bring which that, is a great group. Yeah, and you help bring that group from 23 million to 30 million. I think mm -hmm. I heard somewhere that you, your group was 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 third behind the Democratic and Republican Party. Yeah, some people as, say that. Yeah. Some people say that. I don't know that it's really true, but, yeah, yeah. but to have 30 million people in a group is, is significant. It's good. it's good. And you led it's, it well. You did a great job while you're there. I've heard good things about what you did. While I enjoyed you're there. it. I was so sad that they, it ended in a scandal, but yeah. that certainly wasn't the NAE's fault. That was my fault. Yeah. And you had one of the most successful churches in America at the same yeah. time. It was a very influential church. Yeah. There in Colorado Springs, largest church in a three-state region. Yeah. And so we were And that were, was never we your privileged. goal. You're, you never had a goal. I'm going to build, well, build the no, biggest church. No. And, and I've, I've never had, like, I've never had goals for things like that. I've always felt as though you just be faithful in the small things. Yeah. You just faithfully serve. Yeah. And so we started a prayer meeting in the basement of our home, and people just kept coming. Yeah. And so we kept getting different buildings and hiring more staff and yeah. going through the process. But but I've never been the type of guy that says God has called me to build something big or to lead something big or or anything like that. So much so I when I was pastoring New Life Church, we had a universal pay scale system. So I was on the same pay scale as the youth pastor and the janitors and the administrators in the church. And so, because I felt as though all of us were obeying God's plan for our lives. Yeah. And so, just because I'm the senior pastor and the other guy is called to be a youth pastor, he doesn't need to pay financially for that. Yeah. So, he was on the same pay scale as I was, and which is why when the scandal happened in 2006, we were broke. <laughs> and so... <laughs> you didn't have so, a lot stored up and no, built up. And I was working hard. I have five children, yeah. and all five of them were in school. So I had to earn $10,000 a month just to pay their school bills. Wow. And so we have a handicapped son that costs quite a bit and, yeah. and other things. And so I was writing books. I was traveling and speaking. Yeah. I was doing everything I could to try to keep up with that. So we didn't, we weren't ahead. Yeah. See, and so, and I, I just thought as time goes on, the kids will grow and get through school and we'll be able to get ahead. But then the crisis happened. It caught us and we're... We're still recovering from that. But you guys, you guys are getting through it. Yep. And, and, and that's exciting. You know, the thing that, uh, going back to what really um, tug, put a tug on my heart was, here you were doing everything you knew to do. Mm -hmm. Here you fell. Here everything, your sin was exposed to the whole world. Mm -hmm. um, well, and exaggerated. And exaggerated. Yeah. A lot of untruths. Yeah. A lot of stuff that was, that was put in, out there that wasn't true. Right. Um, and... In fact, let's let's talk about that. What were some of the greatest untruths that you, that that you heard? Well, one of the things was uh, my accuser failed a lie detector test. Wow! And I took four lie detector tests to say what he was saying was not true. So and it was a, what it he was said never was covered. exaggerated. He just blew was, up a bigger thing. It, yeah, it was hugely exaggerated. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, and things like see reporters want whoever they're covering to be as important as possible yep. so they get a better position in their, so their article gets a better position or their, yeah. their news clip. And so I never had a weekly conference call with George Bush. Um, I, uh, it actually, I think were, GQ, had, I think, had mentioned that on, on their article. Oh, well, reporters are typically yeah. um, lazy. Yeah. And so if one reporter writes it, then others we'll will just it write it. Yeah. And so um, so things like that. I, I'd never been a tell, tele evangelist. Yeah. I'd always just pastored our local church and was totally happy with that. I'd never had a radio program, never had a TV program. And um, and but they portrayed me like an anti-gay, tele-evangelist, political crusader. And I was never that. I had never even contacted a political person to say, this is the stance of the NAE. Yeah. Political people would contact our office and ask me to come. And so I'd met with several prime ministers and presidents and people like that, but upon their request. Yeah. See, so I never, and I always felt as though, look, life is a gift. Yeah. And so there was one time when I was with George Bush in the White House, in the Oval Office, I got on a plane, went to Mexico, and three days later, I was leading a little meeting in a mud hut. And in my world, both of those are equally important. 
That's great. You know, you're talking about your your exposure and your accuser exaggerating stuff. Mm-hmm. And even the accuser, the reason he said he exposed you because you were coming against yeah, uh, and it, homosexuality. And, never and I never found any evidence. Never. I, I looked. I said, never. I never seen him speak against homosexuality. Ever. Ever. Here's the worst thing they could find yeah. about me being an anti-gay bigot. Yeah. And that the the article, the whole scandal was based on. He says he's anti-gay, but he's secretly gay. Yeah, you know, yeah. and so he's a hypocrite. That's what. Yeah, and so, but the sec- but but uh, it was so exaggerated and and so confused because the worst thing they could find about me being an anti-gay bigot. Yeah was me saying one time in church, in church, not a protest rally, yep. not a city council meeting, not at the state legislature or Congress. Right. In church, I said, if you have questions regarding your sexuality, consult the Bible. Yeah. And I said it in that tone of voice. It wasn't harsh. Yep. It wasn't anything Angry. like that. And I believe the Bible's the word of God. Yeah. And so, uh, so I believe, and, and so actually on the web, if it'll say Ted Haggard's hate speech. Yeah. And what it is, is me saying, if you have questions about your sexuality, consult the Bible. Oh <laughs> so the headline, the headline is dramatic and negative. Yeah. But if you look at it, you kind of go, what? And sometimes a headline is all people see. Right. So then and, they put all kinds and of And by the way, it's very important that you and all of our listeners understand, headline writers are not the reporters. Yeah. When, when somebody writes for a newspaper, they write the article, then an editor that was not there takes out what he or she needs to take out to make it fit in the space in the newspaper. Then a totally different person that hasn't been involved reads the first paragraph and writes a headline. And sometimes the headline doesn't have anything to do with the article. It, the purpose of the headline is to get people to read the article, the but the headline is not part of the article. Wow. And so several of the headlines about me were just totally uh, made up, but I don't mind. I mean, we live, in a, we live in a fallen world, and Satan is the accuser of the brethren. All of us are flawed. I'm not perfect. Yeah. Some of, some of the accusations were true. Even today, you're not true. perfect. Even today. <laughs> all right? And so, so some of the accusations were true. Yeah. If I was going to respond, then it was going to be tit for tat. Plus, I wanted to submit to the church yeah. and the restoration program, which meant I couldn't respond. Yeah. And so, so when I took four lie detector tests to say that my accuser wasn't telling the truth, everybody decided not to cover that. Isn't that something? And here's the other thing. Yeah. You're going through all the protocols. You had some big name guys. I think Jack Hayford, mm-hmm. uh, uh, Tommy Barnett. Yeah. Uh, who else was there involved? I think those two. Stockstill. Uh, Larry Stockstill, Stockstill down in Baton Rouge. Yeah. So these guys are involved in the process. HB London and Focus on the Family. Yeah. And from, from my perspective, you were doing everything you knew to de- do. Keep your family together. Right. Uh, get healed. All right. Go through the process that others that you respected right. uh, were telling you to do. And yet the church, the, the, a, a lot of people out there remained angry and hateful. Yes, actually, there's not been a significant leader that's c- resigned, confessed, repented, and submitted since me. And it's because my confession and repentance has been used against me and will, will probably be used against me the rest of my life. So now when somebody goes through something like that, they deny, they hire an attorney, they hire a public relations firm, and they adjust. How, how can- and, so, and lots of well-respected people have done that since my deal, because they learned with my deal, if you confess and repent and submit and resign from everything, see, as soon as you resign, yeah then the entity that you were instrumental in building becomes your enemy because they have to prepare for the next leader. Mm. And so, so, and you lose your, your basis of communication. And so you end up blocked out. And that's why uh, if you'll think about some of the leaders that have happened since 2006, they don't resign. They stay in their pulpits yeah. or they stay on their TV shows or whatever, and they give their best argument. 
Yeah, and then so they can't be authentic. They, they probably are not going to get the healing they need if they are. Well, it's just a different process. Yeah. But, but I do think that we do have a flaw because, you see, see, the number one test of our character is how we respond to someone else's sin. Yeah. It reveals everything about us when we're responding to another person's failure. Yeah. You mentioned three the, things. The three number things. one measure of how much we understand the New Testament is by how we respond to somebody else's sin. Mm. So our response to somebody else's sin reveals everything about us. So, so if we're, as we go through that response, it reveals if we're healing, restorative, if we have God's view on thing, or if everything's about us. I'm just so wounded, I'm yeah. just so hurt. I had a lady call me, she was so wounded over the Tiger Woods thing. So I figured she was a friend of the family. Yeah. Found out she doesn't golf, she didn't know the family. She was just so wounded. And I essentially said to her, look, life is rough, get a helmet. Yeah, you know <laughs> What Tiger Woods going through is between him and his wife and his kids yeah. and the golfing association and things like that. Yeah. Doesn't have a thing to do with you. So yeah. there's no reason for you to be hurt. You need to be restorative. What is you know? it within us? I mean, you, you talked about these elements within us, but when you're talking about a large percentage of the church that that has this that takes it upon themselves personally to be angry at uh at, at someone who's fallen yeah regardless if they're part of the church or not part just like you said tiger woods what is that what does that tell us about our churches oh, I, today I, well i think it's just being selfish i mean uh david letterman has been restored yeah and nobody introduces david letterman with his scandal yeah. michael vick has been restored certainly bill clinton yeah. has been restored in a dramatic way. Now he's probably the most influential person in the Democratic Party. Yeah. And, um, and so, and Martha Stewart. Yeah. I mean, she's selling towels at Kmart. <laughs> and, and when she's introduced, nobody says, this is the person that lied to federal prosecutors. Yeah. Nobody, and, and so with Michael Vick, when he's playing football, nobody says, here's the video clip of him, yeah. his scandal. Yeah. Nobody does that. So the world, will allow restoration. We don't have one story. And we're not- We don't have one. That's true. And so one notable one. Now yeah. there are some smaller churches that have successfully done it. Yeah. But we hate people that, um, we make them idols. Yep. They don't make themselves idols. We make them idols. Then when they're not perfect, then we blame them. Yeah. Unforgiveness means you owe me something. Yeah. And see, lots of times when people have unforgiveness, they haven't even thought about what the person owes them. But some would say, they just randomly say, well, they shouldn't be in ministry. Or they shouldn't be in ministry for two years. Or they, um, is it just whatever, people randomly, or they owe me a personal apology. Or whatever. Yeah. And so... Um, our empathy. Where is our empathy? You know, my first thing was his family. Well, it's roles. I mean, Ted, his it, Exactly. It's roles. See, it, here's the way... Now, this is a generalization, so it's right. false. Right. There are exceptions. But generally speaking, the Bible will do a good job of teaching and instructing us. Satan does a more than adequate job accusing us. Okay? Um, God will do a fine job judging us. That's, that's good. That's his role. Okay. Journalists are, will do a fine job gossiping. Good. They're going to tell everybody everything they know. Right. The district attorney can be an expert in people's sins. But none of those are our primary role. Yeah. Our primary role is to be a believer in the Lord Jesus, which means our role is to encourage whatever the Holy Spirit is doing in the heal. man or, or the woman. Encouragement includes healing, restoration. We are supposed to do what Christ does. Christ will leave the 99 to pursue the one. Okay, all Jesus does is make intercession for us, heal us, give us another opportunity, encourage us, strengthen us. And so that's our role. Yeah. And so, so for us to fragment and divorce in our churches, we find out the youth pastors peeping in the neighbor lady's window. So he just disappears. That is not the way to do it. No. When we find out he's peeping in the neighbor lady's window, we meet with him and work him through a process so he can be okay. Yeah. So his wife and his kids will be fine. See, sin 
They, we have to decide what is the solution to the sin problem. Yeah. Is it the Old Testament or the New? Yeah. If it's the Old Testament, we need to punish them and make an example of them. If it's the New Testament, we need to heal them and restore it. And of course, we're New Testament believers. I was part of a church where the, where the and this guy was an associate pastor, this was years ago, beautiful musician, beautiful family, uh, had an indiscretionary moment with one of the choir members. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and basically, at the, at the time that it was discovered, uh, the, you know, they nipped it in the bud before it got too much of a, a romantic situation. But he got, basically, he and his family were removed from the ministry, even though he was a big part of the ministry. So instead of, so, so he was removed, and then, and I think it was the Assembly of God Church, so he was put on a two-year, uh, I forget what they call it, a sabbatical thing where he can't do any ministry, and they go through the pro healing process. But then when he comes back, he can't come back to that church. See, that's, that's stupid. Yeah. Okay, and they say, well, we want to give people room. Matthew 18 is perfectly clear. If there's an offense between people, they need to see each other. Yeah. That's how we all get stronger. Okay, now, I believe a person may need to step out yes. for the purpose of their healing. If it's punitive, they should not step out because yeah. that's not our role. Yeah. Every pastor is a sinner. Luther said we're all simultaneously saints and sinners. Yeah. So now we're growing in sanctification. Every worship leader is a sinner. Every Sunday school teacher is a sinner. And every person passing judgment is a sinner. Yeah. And by the way, everybody lies, yeah. but the judgmental people lie more than anybody else. All right, so, so, so see, when he went through that, the testimony would be, in, in Galatians, the sixth chapter, where it says, restore somebody gently. Okay, you who are spiritual, restore somebody gently. That means, restoration means, make it as if the, the violation never happened. So when you go into a house and restore it, you make it like it was or better. Yeah. And, and see, these, my, here's my uh, belief. I believe all of us that are committed to the Lord, when we go through a scandal or a disappointment or a heartache, that's the painful process that's necessary to make us the type of people we want to be. Mm. See, Swagger went through his thing. Yeah. He's been faithful to Francis for 30 years now. Everybody ought to love him. And how come we don't and, hear about that? And, and these, these success stories. No, now. they no. It's very interesting because because he did not go through the Assembly of God program, so that's his sin. But the purpose of that program is to make him faithful to Francis. So see, we got the end result. But they didn't get the credit. They didn't get the credit, and so 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 most people hate him to this day. And he's a, he's a wonderful and guy. And they relive it and, in their minds as if it and, happened yesterday. And what he went through, see, I mean, he has had a, a, a sexual addiction, had had a sexual addiction since he was 13 when he went through puberty. All right. So it finally came out. That guy had repented of that a thousand times, but he had an issue that he needed to walk through. All right. He went through the initial scandal. Then two years later, had another incident, got caught. All right. And every therapist will tell you, in order to have deep, significant change inside of us, it has to be painful. Wow. And, and so, so when Bill Clinton went through the Monica Lewinsky thing, he changed. When I went through my 2006 thing, I changed. Yeah. And, uh, and so I felt like... It probably took something like that for change, doesn't it, sometimes? Well, yeah, because my issue was physiological. It wasn't spiritual, and it wasn't a sexual orientation issue. It was a physiological issue. All right, so I had gone to a Christian university that had a disparaging view of therapists and psychology. Okay, when the crisis happened, the leadership guys didn't even pray with me once. Wow. or try to answer anything, they sent me and my wife to a great therapist. That great therapist sat down with us and within the first day said, your issue is not spiritual, your issue is not sexual orientation, your issue is physiological. And so we can give you some tools to deal with that and you can use those tools and you'll be fine.
Yeah, and that and that's and exactly so, what happened, right? And that's exactly what happened. Yeah, wow. and so so and and the, that those physiological things happen. Yeah. You know, the physio physiology is the way our brains function. Yeah. How we respond to pain, how we respond to trauma, how we respond to hope, those types of things. And we're learning enough about that now yeah. that we can actually disempower trauma, yeah. which was my case, yeah. and, uh, and make it so the trauma does not produce compulsive So it wasn't a bunch of demons they had to cast out. No yet. demons. <laughs> <laughs> no demons. Actually, this thing motivated me. I mean, I built a, or was instrumental in building the World Prayer Center, worldprayerteam.org, a prayer and fasting center, all kinds. Of, our church was a praying church. And I think a lot of that was my deep and sincere love for the Lord. But I knew from time to time these thoughts would come. Yeah. And, and it left me as vulnerable. And here's, here's the question. As a leader, and, and I don't know if you, if you at the time were looking back at other leaders that had opened themselves up to their elders or other people that would try to help them and then get slammed. As a leader, the pro, you probably were thinking, I can't go to anybody. No, I went to them. But, but my, right away? My, my, no, 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 no. Over the years. Over the prior. years. Oh, you had gone oh, to yeah. them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and what, did, what did they recommend at the time? All stupid things. Like one of them, the, my pastor, he said, all right, so follow this. I'm pastoring a 14,000 member church. I'm leading a 30 million National Association of Evangelicals. I've got the world's largest prayer site, uh, worldprayerteam.org at that time. And um, we had an association of life-giving churches. So it was a mini denomination. Right. Okay, so I have four jobs, not counting writing books, and traveling and speaking. Okay, all that's going on. So I go to my pastor and I say, and, you, and it's not the pastor's fault because pastors aren't trained in, in the physiology of the brain. They, all pastor, most pastors assume if somebody thinks something or does something, it's a reflection of their character. Where many times it's not a reflection yeah. of their character. It's a response to some trauma or a response to something else. Yeah. All right, so anyway, what my pastor told me is, Brother Ted, he's a Southerner, yeah. you need to be more involved at the church. <laughs> oh, boy. So his solution was... More work. Work more, which was the opposite of the case. Because of the physiology of the way our brains work, if we have something that's going on inside of us because of a past trauma, if we deny it, if we try to act like it's not there, if we try to just work and ignore it, it actually makes it worse. It creates a more compulsive behavior. You have to address it. Yeah. But he didn't know that. And um, what are and some of the other things so, that people told so, you? Uh, oh, we tried accountability. Yeah. We we so with some we had the accountability, the famous, the the infamous accountability yeah, yeah. system. Yeah. All right. Think about accountability. The New Testament does not teach us that. No. Accountability is external. Uh, external control. Yeah. It's an Old Testament system. New Testament is advocacy. I like that. We become each other's advocates. advocates. Like you became an advocate of mine. Yeah. All right. And so, and that strengthens me. Yeah. See? And, and you have, it builds and trust. So, so, exactly. Where there's no model in the New Testament for that kind of accountability, but I tried that because it's popular and you know, promise keepers did it. Yeah. And so we, we tried accountability, we tried a variety of different things as, as time went by, and, um, and we enjoyed a great measure of success, but I had an internal war going on. And see, I didn't understand it because the New Testament says where we become a new creation, we have the renewal of the mind, and so we have internal transformation. The Old Testament is external control. Mm. If you're bad, you'll be punished. If you're good, you'll be rewarded. rewarded. Okay, so the Old Testament is essentially behavioral modification. It didn't work. Which a Hebrews, lot of the church is operating in that. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews is perfectly clear about how the old, the, uh, the law did not work at changing us. And the New Testament changes us. And so, um, so, yeah, it's very important that we really believe the New Testament is the solution to the sin problem. And it's very important that we let God work. 
so that if a person goes through a crisis, they can go through the crisis. We're there, like my family was, we're there to be encouraging and walk them through the process and help everybody get healed. That's awesome. That's the New Testament. Well, Ted, we're, we're moving past this first session. We're going to have a, a, another session with Ted coming up. But Ted, this first, time, this first session was great. Thanks great, for being thank with you. us. Great.